Thanks, Philippe, and thanks everybody for staying. Um, it's a familiar role, the last uh, speaker, usually after the hotel checkout. Um, anyway, this will be on the internet, I guess, so you don't get a lot of jokes on that. Um, so what's on the, uh, the I, we can make a separate bloopers. Um, um, so what, what's on the horizon for next year? Uh, I'm gonna have some uh, kind of forward-looking statements in the SEC uh, sense of the word. And um, let's, uh, let's have a look and uh, we can go back next year, see if um, I'm right, sometimes I'm right. Um, and uh, anyway, here's a, a couple slides. And we have a, a firm 6 p.m. commitment. You can move that clock, I'm gonna, I'm gonna win it. So. Um, so here's, anyway, thanks for staying. There's a picture of my, uh, my grandmother and my great-grandparents from about uh, 90 years ago. There, so that's uh, some staying power. Uh, that's in, uh, we visited uh, Moldova, so that's in Moldova. They did not stay in Moldova, so that was like the last. So, uh, I work with uh, uh, drug companies. I like drug companies. They got good medicines. That they brought us here today, so here's some of the ones we work with. Um, uh, details matter. Uh, I've been uh, preceded by many excellent uh, speakers, and we will not uh, go over some of their uh, uh, good points, but uh, details matter. Here's some of the uh, histology differences. Uh, here's some of the anatomic differences that we might find. And uh, knowing that, it, it almost seems unfair to just say, well, here we are at the Kidney Cancer Association. You know, it started in the same location in the kidney, so we should treat it the same. Well, they're not the same. Um, uh, here's some of the uh, uh, risk factors. We know the patients with more problems there have a disease with a, uh, a different natural history, a faster natural history uh, versus a slower one. Uh, molecular details matter. Sometimes uh, there's a drug which exactly fits onto a, a particular target. Well, if the target's there, you have a chance. If the target's not even there, uh, then uh, time to move on and try something else. Um, uh, sometimes uh, we like talking about medicines, but uh, we had uh, good presentations uh, about the local therapies. Local therapies can make all the difference. Uh, clear cell kidney cancer in particular sometimes will have a, a very irregular pattern of spread, and there might be a, a one problem area. You fix that problem area, and you're done. You don't really have to do anything. I have a you know, patient 10 years out presented with a tumor in his, in his leg and in the kidney, took care of both of those and nothing happened uh, since then. Um, uh, other times there are brain lesions, uh, kidney cancer can spread to brain, but it just sits there. Uh, sometimes it, it's much worse. Other times it just sits there, you take it out, move on, and uh, very early on, one of the uh, 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 trials, uh, just looking at an open access program for serafinib, identified that people with brain pattern of spread, they track just along with people with no brain pattern of spread. I, I have patients who had interleukin-2 treatment who are a decade out after having had brain pattern of spread and there's no disease left. Uh, so it's uh, pretty uh, uh, different um, in that sense uh, that sometimes uh, you just, you don't need a drug at all, uh, just a strategy. Uh, so we're gonna talk about uh, what happens in a trial versus what happens to a patient. And uh, I know with my colleagues, uh, many remaining still in the back, uh, we're interested in, in general concepts, but as soon as we step into the room, really only interested in one person. Um, so it can be a little bit of a different exper experience. So here's a, uh, a cartoon with uh, a bunch of colored spots, and you average them together, and it looks something like that. But you know you can't uh, go back and make little mini, mini me's out of the trial. Um, here's uh, some of these uh, risk factors, which uh, we don't need to go over now, just to say this, uh, this figure, which we all saw before, uh, shows that more risk factors uh, is worse. And it's embarrassing to say, we're, we're making some progress with it, but the dominant factor on how well people do is whatever they walked in the door with. Uh, we're, we're changing that, but um, these are uh, the, some of the risk factors uh, which we've uh, had experience with. Um, how many prior treatments has a patient has? Well, uh, pharmaceutical companies love this, and the FDA loves this, and a lot of times you'll see 1L or 2L first line or second line or immune therapy naive or checkpoint naive. Well, guess what? Cancer doesn't care. It just depends what you have uh, walking in the door. So it's a good way to organize things, but it's not quite biologic. Um, here's, uh, here's a nice diagram of uh, looking at the uh, two factors, uh, prior treatment or not, and good risk or or uh, high risk or low risk, and uh, the trials as they come along, they kind of carve out subsets of patients and we reach some conclusions. And 
they're good conclusions. Uh, they're, they're a good conclusion for the patients within that set, and as they get a little bit outside the set, you might be extrapolating a little bit, but you can still say, well, it looks like this drug is better than, than that one. And then uh, real life comes along, you say, we're gonna use this trial, and your next three patients, they're not in the group. Uh, so uh, there's a bit of judgment involved, and this is not special to uh, kidney cancer, but um, just something to remember. Uh, VEGF receptors, I think uh, you've had a good schooling on this the VEGF receptor pathway. What's ahead for that? Well, the old role was a lot of uh, single-agent treatments and some sequencing strategies, uh, intermittent strategies. Uh, Sinitinib, the dominant drug for a decade, was uh, mostly prescribed at 28 days on or 14 days off. Turns out that's hard to tolerate, and many patients wouldn't complete the whole 28 days, and then they'd stop and wait a couple weeks and, and get started again. But actually, more rapid cycling, 14 days on and seven days off, uh, seems to be better tolerated and probably works better and may get more drug into the patient. Um, so many of the trials that used a sinitinib as a comparison, uh, they may have actually handicapped the sinitinib arm. Uh, and in real life, this didn't matter that much, but on the trials, you might have had the sinitinib uh, it ended up uh, losing by a bigger margin than it otherwise would have. Why wouldn't it, it matter in real life? Your oncologist probably knows this already and would adjust your schedule uh, if you're on a regular, uh, on a regular treatment, uh, adjust your schedule to make it meet you. This is not unique to sinitinib. Uh, many other uh, of these medications need some schedule adjustments. Um, here's uh, another cartoon with the VEGF receptor pathway. Uh, there's a tumor cell and there's uh, uh, some of the VEGF drugs blocking the VEGF receptor. Uh, the money is probably on the endothelial cell, although the tumor cells themselves have some of that. Um, here is uh, lenvatinib, also blocks uh, this uh, FGFR receptor. Not all cancers have this, not all clear cell kidney cancers have this, but it may matter for some. Uh, here's uh, cabozantinib, it blocks uh, CMET and Axel, and those are actually more dominant targets on the tumor cell. So there is some sense that uh, blocking the VEGF with a VEGF drug uh, may be something that could be salvaged with cabozantinib. So we're seeing a lot more cabozantinib in 2019. Uh, talking about immune therapy, uh, we got a good, a good education on that here as well. Um, the immune therapy, uh, uh, the PD-1 pathway uh, was used mostly in isolation, and uh, IL-2 and interleukin-2, another one also used in isolation. These are proteins on the white blood cell surface, also CTLA-4. And the drug in this case uh, works on the immune cell, and the immune cell has to do what it was born to do, which is attack something, um, but the drug isn't really attacking the cancer directly. Um, so let's talk about uh, one partner, which I think is gonna be a big partner in 2019 and beyond, to use the catchphrase. Um, and that's the IL-2 receptor. And it's an odd choice to say that the IL-2 receptor is gonna be a big deal in the future because it was a big deal in the past. Uh, interleukin-2, I mean, it's got a really low number, a two, um, is uh, one of the proteins that white blood cells make to communicate with each other. And there is a receptor on the lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, uh, CD4 T lymphocytes, CD8 T lymphocytes, natural kill lymphocytes, IL-2 receptor. And it gets the IL-2 and it changes its behavior. It, divides more, it uh, goes to attack more. Uh, interleukin-2 receptor is used in a lot of lymphocyte-based treatments. Uh, we talked uh, for a minute about uh, CAR T cells. So the CAR T cells are the patient's own T cells taken out of the body, expanded. Expanded with what? With interleukin-2. And then reinfused back in after the uh, patient's own white blood cells have been kind of wiped out to clear the stables. And, and the patient gets a few doses of what? of interleukin-2 to help those lymphocytes to expand. Now, we don't have CAR T cells that are available for kidney cancer therapy. The antigen uh, matters. Uh, solid tumor CAR T cells have been uh, slow to develop as a technology, but uh, that interleukin-2 receptor is what's on those uh, cells. Similarly, TIL cells, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, this was initially tested in kidney cancer. The uh, tumor is taken out, uh, interleukin-2 is put on there, it grows out the lymphocytes, and they have a population of lymphocytes which were at least smart enough to get into the tumor. Then those are reinfused back into the patient, and at the point they're put back in, they're given interleukin-2. So interleukin-2 receptor is something that helps support lymphocyte activity, which is what we're interested in. Um, we have some uh, uh, combinations of medications that use interleukin-2 receptor and 
uh, PD-1 receptor at the same time. They're listed here. So uh, pembrolizumab with high-dose IL-2. That was a, a single-arm study. We're finishing that up at the Moffitt Cancer Center. Uh, Nectar and nivolumab. Nectar is one of the engineered IL-2 drugs. I'll show you that. Uh, that, together with nivolumab and ipilimumab as well, that's also in initial testing. And ALKS-4230, an engineered IL-2 also uh, in early testing with the PD-1 Um, so here's a native IL-2. It's just a, a small protein. It's got a, a three-part receptor illustrated there with the blue, green, and red, which is beta, gamma, and alpha. And IL-2 little uh, oval there attaches on there. The alpha part's a special part. It doesn't really stick into the cell, but it stabilizes the IL-2 onto the other part of the IL-2 receptor. Uh, there's two kinds of IL-2 receptors, just the beta, gamma, or what the alpha also. The cells we think are attacking the cancer have just the beta-gamma one, called the intermediate uh, receptor. Um, here's a, a cartoon showing the native IL-2, which is now pink in this uh, uh, illustration. And you can see it either binds the two-part the two, the two part one or the three-part one with the alpha attached so it stays on longer. Uh, here's one of these, Alchemy's 4230. This is uh, completed its uh, single agent testing in man, and now it's going to be doing combination testing, so it's a phase one trial, uh, phase one trial, but you're kind of getting a good deal on both drugs. You get the ALKS42, which is an engineered IL-2. It's got an a IL-2 receptor alpha pre-attached onto it uh, in a single chain. Um, and this is how they did it with a little uh, permutation of the protein sequence, which is uh, pretty interesting if you have a PhD in biochemistry, but otherwise it's just a cartoon there. Um, and um, then that, that trial is being given together with the pembrolizumab, which we know already uh, is active in uh, kidney cancer. Uh, here's another one, Nectar. Nectar is the company, Nectar 214. Um, so the uh, sequence of interleukin-2, which is a small protein, has uh, some different amino acids. Uh, six of them are a kind called lysine, and lysine is particularly good for attaching things to it. So in this case, they've attached a thing called PEG, polyethylene glycol. So polyethylene glycol is a big, long molecule. Uh, you may uh, recall it, uh, seeing it on your ice cream ingredients. It's used as a thickener. Um, anyways, not, not toxic, it just sits there. Uh, however, it's so big that the IL-2 is effectively a pro-drug. It's like the drug is in there, but it's got these extra pieces. Uh, the attachments are not particularly stable, and they pop off. And then uh, when it's down to one or two, that's good enough, and it can fit onto the receptor. So this is in a, a trial with a dozen different diagnoses, kidney cancer included. And uh, there's been uh, several complete responses already reported uh, with that. The frequency of complete responses, we don't want to especially uh, speculate on that. This is a low number of patients, but uh, they're definitely out there. I have one, one patient who's done quite well uh, with that. Um, there are at least a dozen other ways to engineer IL-2. Here's one which has only been tested in uh, the test tube. It hasn't even made it to mouse testing. And what they do is they take the lymphocytes out, give them an IL-2 receptor which doesn't fit IL-2. It only fits a special IL-2. Then they give them a special IL-2. It only fits onto there. And what's the advantage of that is you could take your lymphocytes out and only have the population that you want to respond to that. So maybe the CD4 cells, which are, we have a regulatory function, you don't want them to see IL-2, well, you could use this uh, special engineered combination. We'll see if that comes out. That won't be in 2019, however. Um, so as far as uh, on lymphocyte targets, and uh, you've seen most of this before, uh, I'm just highlighting the IL-2 receptor there with the IL-2 and the other engineered IL-2s on the left side of the slide, and on the right side, uh, uh, PD-1 and PD-L1. Uh, those are uh, ones we've talked about before. With the, those are kind of the, the breaks. And then on the right lower corner, there's the tremilumumab and ipilimumab, which blocks CTLA-4, uh, which is part of the priming response. Um, so looking at uh, PD-1, uh, happily for me and uh, the time, uh, these are the same slides you've seen before. This is the same key paper here um, with initial therapy of those two uh, medications together versus uh, sinitinib. And uh, uh, just uh, uh, going through it uh, uh, briefly, we see that uh, the ipilimumab nivolumab combination uh, was better uh, with some complete responses observed. Uh, on the other hand, in the favor favorable risk subset, which was a smaller subset, it was planned to be a smaller subset, but the sinitinib uh, appears to be better 
uh, for those patients, especially if they don't have the PDL1 uh, protein. Um, so, anyway, as I said, the details matter. Uh, the evolution of how to pick patients for which of these uh, drugs, and the reality is really we're just picking which drug first because if one doesn't work, we're going to uh, take a step back and try the other. Um, and uh, there's a graphic there. Um, and here's the same lines that we saw before uh, with the uh, ipilimumab nivolumab uh, graphs on the right there. Um, again, uh, a trial we've already seen, the uh, Emotion uh, 151 with the tezolizumab, bevacizumab, uh, the uh, PDL1, and the VEGF receptor, uh, sorry, VEGF uh, antibody uh, versus sinitinib, again, with the combination uh, doing relatively well. Uh, here's another one we've seen as well with axitinib, the VEGF uh, uh, antagonist pill with pembrolizumab and uh, just a striking number, uh, proportion of patients who really get their tumors to get smaller. Uh, as uh, uh, Joe Lee just mentioned, w we get a lot of graphs with uh, tumors getting smaller and we have to take a step back. Mike talked about this, Mike Harrison, about what do patients really want? Uh, a paper which I didn't put in here, we uh, BMS and I uh, worked with them and they, they took a survey to ask patients what they really wanted. And it was a little bit uh, uh, anticlimactic. Turns out patients really want to live longer. Um, and you get a graph like this, and uh, it becomes like an ironic question. It says, if patients want to live longer, how come from the day they're diagnosed till the day they die, all they talk about is how big is the tumor? Well, that's the only accessible thing we have uh, there. So anyway, that, that's again one of those graphs, uh, graphs there. Um, here's uh, a big question. Here is adjuvant sinitinib, and uh, uh, Naomi Haas talked about this uh, uh, trial, the S-TRAC trial, the single positive uh, adjuvant trial. Uh, we see the blue line, the patients who got sinitinib had a lower rate of reoccurrence as compared to the patients who didn't get sinitinib, uh, but the overall survival is about the same on both arms. They've updated it. Um, it's a, f a few patients ahead on the uh, sutent upfront arm as opposed to the uh, uh, placebo up front arm, but still not a significant difference. So is this uh, 2009 technology playing out, or is this 2019? Well, uh, there might be some subsets that do particularly better where it makes a big difference. So this has been uh, uh, looked at in, in a few uh, different ways. Uh, the first was just a generally uh, easy answer, which is that uh, whether it was a T3 tumor, a T4 tumor, patient had symptoms or no symptoms, or high-grade ferment or not, it came out to be about the same. So that didn't add much information. But uh, two of the uh, uh, other uh, subset analyses uh, give some hints. So in this one uh, from uh, Dr. Rini as the uh, main author here, um, we see that uh, there's a, this uh, 16 gene uh, recurrence score. And they didn't have that many patients on it, but you can see that at least in the placebo group, it really matters which, uh, what, what, what your score is. On the other hand, in the treatment group, the lines are closer together. So we already know that the treatment group had a better progression-free survival, but also that the lines get closer together. So at least for the worst group, uh, which would be the red line on the, on the left panel, um, it probably makes a bigger difference. So the people in the worst group uh, it, makes a, it looks like it makes a bigger difference that they should really be on something uh, besides uh, observation. Now this is a, a, a secondary analysis on a fraction of the patients, um, but uh, that's uh, at least a hint on that. And then uh, similarly, looking at the markers in the tumor, uh, we already knew that PDL1 uh, seems to be a marker for uh, patients with a higher progression rate. And uh, looking at this here, we again see one line standing out, which is the placebo patients that had PDL1 on their tumor, uh, the blue line on the right graph there. So uh, that's a hint maybe uh, to help us out on adjuvant uh, selection, patient selection. There's three large, very large, very slow adjuvant studies accruing now. Uh, check again, uh, this won't be in 2019. This will be in the 2023, 24, when we may get a readout. Uh, whether starting those immune therapies very early uh, helps. Um, 
uh, I have a, a trial here, and this is uh, just for uh, general interest on how the, uh, we had set up that trial there. It's finished accrual, and uh, we wanted to get at least 45% major response rate. We've got a lock on 60%, so it does look, again, that uh, uh, putting those two types of immune therapies uh, together uh, seems to be better than one. Now, with a single agent, uh, sorry, a single arm trial, uh, we don't want to really uh, make any uh, comparison statements and uh, we know that uh, picking the patients carefully is probably the best way to good, get a good response. Uh, here's some art from uh, my trip to Moldova. Um, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, I guess at least one person in the room thinks it's hard to use. I use it all the time, um, but I think we'll work with uh, KCA, maybe get some tutorials on that. Um, it's true. I can't know all the trials there are. If you look on this, uh, here it says there are 284,824 research studies um, in uh, 204 countries. So, yeah, you'd have a pretty uh, psychotic doctor who had a really working knowledge of this. Um, but uh, you can use it to look up some things. Uh, here's one uh, we can look up. This is a CB839, a Calathera's product, the glutaminase inhibitor. We had a good... Um, presentation on that, and uh, a couple trials uh, with co combined with that are open. The first two are open. I think the third one is just a planned uh, trial there. Um, Abexinostat, that's an HDAC inhibitor. Uh, HDAC inhibitors, probably 20 HDAC trials have been come and gone in oncology. A couple have approvals in uh, hematologic malignancies, but they're still waiting to hit the big time uh, for solid tumors. So this is a combination. Uh, everybody gets pizopinib. It's a phase three trial. But they either get pizopinib and nothing, or they get pizopinib with the new drug uh, added on. Um, so that uh, is, a, is a, a registrational trial, and uh, sh it should be a couple years till it accrue. Uh, the exciting thing is it's an HDAC inhibitor, which has nothing to do with all the other things we were talking about, so kind of a new angle uh, on this. Um, here's another HDAC inhibitor called Entinostat. You might remember Entinostat is a partner drug with IL-2. Uh, this was a single-arm trial which did relatively well, and uh, Entinostat only blocks HDAC-1. Um, coordination with radiation therapy and other destruction, uh, destroying stuff. That really gets the attention of the immune system, uh, changes a lot of things in the tumor and in the immune response. Uh, and there's about eight, eight different trials in kidney cancer, probably another 20 in other diagnoses as well. Uh, so I think those will mature. We'll get some more standardized protocols uh, for that. Uh, some of the thinking is that uh, getting to a higher dose with a lower number of fractions uh, may be something that really uh, makes the immune system sit up and uh, get stimulated. Uh, but those are details that we need to work out. Um, the uh, uh, I, I, the idea of uh, using a, a combinations uh, with the PD-1 drug and something else, so at least a two-part immune therapy, uh, that's going to be something we see a lot of. Uh, not clear cell type cancers. Uh, I hate to always give the not clear cell type cancers kind of a quick wrap up, uh, but we at least for the first time in uh, many years have uh, several trials. These are directed at CMET. And, uh, these are going to be slow trials that come around, but uh, we may actually get some targeted drugs which really focus on that. Um, so what's the target year for 2013? Uh, due, due to a defect, it's already on there, but I think it'll pop down. There it is. So I think uh, IL-2 receptor, um, it's on every lymphocyte in your, in your body. He's got IL-2 receptor. We've got the PD, we're kind of, you know, running strong in the age of the PD-1 type trial. And I think that uh, IL-2 receptor, we've been using it as a single agent. We used it uh, in uh, uh, TIL therapy and CAR-T therapy. And uh, I think that uh, we're going to see it uh, have a resurgent, not just as a single agent IL-2, but IL-2 receptor as a partner uh, for these other immune therapies as uh, the, immune, um, the immune era kind of overtakes everything. So uh, anyway, thanks very much. And thanks for the uh, Kidney Cancer Association for organizing this. I want to encourage all of you, uh, you know, in, in your own uh, health, but also uh, to the extent you can, you can advocate and work with the association. It's, uh, it's here for you, and uh, you can be here for it. And uh, I think Gene's going to give us a couple uh, uh, Gene's outside. Good. Um, uh, thanks, thanks to Gene Bureau for organizing, and Gretchen will give us some uh, closing remarks. Thanks.